Hello there. I trust you're all doing really well today. And I um, just came out of a long prayer time and just a beautiful time with the Lord. And I'm praying into something personally. Um, it, it's, it's a theme in my life that I constantly pray through. Um, but I, bit, I was really provoked through a conversation I had with a friend yesterday. And so all last night and again this morning, I've been crying out to God um, to perfect my heart in holiness and separation unto him. And I believe that the key, the key for that is love. And I'm going to share with you some very insightful things on, on this recording. So I hope that you enjoy it and maybe even get you know, a paper and pen and write some of these things down. And maybe I could even put some notes up there later for you because I believe it's, it, it's one of the greatest keys and it's a very powerful message for the church right now. Um, but perfect love towards God and others is actually the very thing that will manifest outward holiness. Uh, because when we be the love of God, because God is love, and he is living in us, and therefore we are created in his love. So when, when we manifest love, and when we operate in love, when we choose love, we're actually manifesting holiness. But the Bible is quite firm that when we are not in the love of God, uh, we are not even in him, we're not abiding in him, and he's not abiding in us. So that's pretty, pretty strong. But I was doing some study this morning on John Wesley, and for those of you don't, who, who don't know who John Wesley is, he was one of the um, catalysts uh, for the first Great Awakening, starting in, in um, England and then, of course, in, into the USA, especially into the, uh, the uh, colonies um, in the uh, eastern part of the USA. Um, he lived um, in the 1700s, and um, he was a key leader, but he taught that in this life, this is a, a quote um, from Wikipedia, from some of the, the study that was done on John Wesley. He taught that in this life, Christians could achieve a state where the love of God reigned supreme in their hearts, giving them outward holiness. So I just wanna say that again. Christians could achieve a state where the love of God reigned supreme in their hearts, giving them outward holiness. And, you know, so often people will try to achieve an outward holiness by, you know, I'll, I'll do this, I won't do that, you know, and they'll work on outward things. But the truth is, is that when we make love our greatest aim, because God is love and we commune with love and we, we are engaged with love himself, then that walk, that engagement, will produce a manifestation of outward holiness. All of our actions, our behaviors, the words we speak, everything will manifest uh, holiness, um, which is that separation unto God and that, and that beautiful perfection that we see in him will then be made manifest through us. And I just love that. And in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, um, Paul said, let love be our greatest aim. Love has to be our greatest aim. And he also teaches, of course, in 1 Corinthians 13, that without love, we are nothing, we have nothing, and it profits nothing. We are nothing, we have nothing, and it profits nothing if we don't have love. So he said, you can have faith to move mountains, you can prophesy totally accurately, you can have all knowledge, um, you can you know, probably preach up a storm or pray the best prayers or whatever. Uh, you can give your body to be burned, all of that. Give all your possessions to the poor. But he said, if you don't have love, he said, I want you to get this because all those outward things are nothing if you don't have love. There's, it's just nothing. And then he, he goes on to, to explain or describe the attributes of love. And he says, love is patient, love is kind, it's not jealous, it doesn't brag, it's not proud or arrogant. It doesn't act or speak unbecomingly. It's not provoked, it's not ir easily irritated. It doesn't take up an offense. It doesn't take into account a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but it rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, it believes all things, it endures all things, and it never fails. I love that. And, and I just believe that we can drink of that all the time. The more we drink of the attributes of love, the more that we will manifest the attributes of love. 
And love, in a nutshell, it just always desires the highest good for the sake of another. So that's not always going to be soft necessarily, like when you're raising your children, you want the very, very best for your children. You want them to know your kindness, your your generosity, your goodness, all of that. But you want them to, to grow in a straight way, not a crooked tree, but a straight tree. And therefore, the Bible says that we have to discipline our children. And discipline isn't always pleasant at the moment, but it yields something good. And a parent is willing to discipline the child because they love them. And if you don't have love, you shouldn't be disciplining because the, the disciplining of a child must be through love, not through agitation or I'm irritated, my kids are bugging me, I'm going to whack them one or whatever. That wouldn't be love. But love will discipline strong and love will even uh, put someone in jail. Love will put someone in jail to protect them and to protect those around them and um, to halt bad behavior that would down them at the end of the day and so love can be very confrontational but the motive behind it is so kind and so beautiful and so and and so saving because it always wants the highest good for the sake of another and that's why it's holy it's got holy motives inside of it so love then is the mark of a true believer i'm going to read you some scriptures that will be enlightening for you it's a mark of a true believer if, if you're not manifesting love, and if you're not known for your love, maybe you're not a true believer. Um, love is the mark also of your maturity in the Lord, of Christian maturity. It's not how well you can preach, not how well you can revelate, not how many people you can get saved. It's, it, it's how well you love God and love people. The testing of your love will reveal the measure of your maturity. And love tests, <clears throat> love tests are not easy sometimes they're so challenging you know when you are you know just like Jesus on the cross I mean he had everyone saying crucify him crucify him these were the very people that he was so kind to he had false witnesses in the court rising up against somebody he just loved 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 and forgave them and gave his life for them laid his life down paid the penalty for their sin I mean wow and so when we or having our love tested because you can have your love tested with God like he might say if you love me would you do this for me and then that would be a test of your love um, or a, a person might treat you wrong like they mistreated Jesus are you willing to love is that it, when when you are squeezed and, and wrung out and stomped on and bruised what squeezes out of you love or anger or self-defense or whatever what squeezes out of you when you're under pressure those are your love tests so let me read to you just a few scriptures and then I'll, I'll give you some insight that I think will be helpful. Um, and at least it's been ministering to me out of this uh, time I'm having with the Lord, so I love to share it with you. Um, but let's use the, the example of James and John. Now, James and John were called the sons of thunder. <laughs> and um, in Luke 9, 54 to 56, said when his disciples, James and John, saw this, it was the Samaritans were... We're not obeying Jesus. They said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Because that's what, you know, they, they were full of justice and they wanted what was right. And they, you know, they wanted people to do what was right. And so if you're not going to do what's right, I'm going to call down fire from heaven and consume you. That was what was in their heart. But Jesus, it says, he turned and rebuked them. Now, why did he rebuke them? You know, it's because he loved them. He rebuked them because he loved them. And a lot of times we, we um, don't realize how precious a rebuke is. I, I try to embrace every rebuke. You have to weigh them out first and make sure that they're righteous rebukes. But I, I love learning from them. So Jesus turned and rebuked these sons of thunder and said, You don't know what spirit you're of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And so he made it clear to them that that wasn't his heart and how that they needed to grow in love because they weren't being holy because they weren't manifesting love. They just wanted to, to bring down fire and consume and destroy the people who were not being obedient to Jesus. But anyone in this world, believers or unbelievers, who are not obeying uh, the Lord, 
our heart should be, let's do whatever we can to turn things around so that they will obey the Lord, so that they will uh, turn in another direction and be saved from the destruction or the consequence of their actions. So John, you know, one of the sons of thunder, James and John were the sons of thunder. John, we see him being used of the Lord to pen the book of Revelation. So he was transformed from a son of thunder wanting to call down fire from heaven and consume people to the apostle of love. He's known as the apostle of love. He wrote the epistles, first, uh, second and third John, uh, the gospel of John, um, the book of Revelation, revealing the love of God. But in the book of Revelation, Jesus is releasing some weighty words to the church. So who does he choose? He didn't choose the son of thunder. He choose, chose the apostle of love. Same person, but someone who had been transformed from being a son of thunder to, to an apostle of love. And another example is Saul in the New, New Testament. Um, Saul was a committed, uh, passionate, zealous believer in God and a great studier of the word. He knew the word. He knew what was true, what was heresy according to the scriptures. At least he thought he did. And in Luke 9, 54 to 56, it says, when his disciple, or, or, I'm, I'm sorry, um, oh, I marked the wrong scripture. It, it's, it's when, um, oh shoot, I'm so sorry, I don't have the scripture. I went and copied and pasted the wrong one. But it's the one where Paul himself talks about his life, um, that he was committed, uh, he, he knew the law better than anyone who knew, as far as zeal, he was so zealous, he was persecuting the church, he was killing believers, and he did all that because of his passion for God. Zeal wasn't an issue. Paul was a student of the word. He knew the word better than anyone. He, he knew the law better than anyone, but he was still missing it. And one of the things was because he didn't understand the love of God. Now, this same apostle who was out contending for the truth to be raised up and, and in the meantime, killing believers while he's doing it, he turns out to be the one who says, let love be your greatest aim, and writes 1 Corinthians 13, the whole chapter, the love chapter, that is one of the, the, the most significant chapters in the Bible today. And so it, it, it's just amazing the, the transformation that took place. And instead of this religious, zealous man now, who really loved the Lord before, he really loved God before, but not according to the truth. He just didn't have the truth about God's love. So he goes from being Saul to Paul and is known to us today as the apostle of grace. So we see John going from a son of thunder to a, a, an apostle of love. And we see Paul going from, from a religious zealot uh, killing Christians to the apostle of grace and writing a whole book on the chapter of love. And I think that's amazing. And I've cried out to God in my own life and said, I want to be transformed every single day into more and more love. I want more and more love operating within my uh, life. So the love standard, let's take a look at some scriptures here and see what, what Jesus says in his word about love. In Matthew 5, 43 to 44, Jesus said this, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, this is New Testament, because even in the Old Testament, you'll see, um, you know, David even saying, I hate my enemies, right? Or I hate your enemies, Lord. But he said, he said, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus loves his enemies. If he loves his enemies, we're to love his enemies too. And we're to love our enemies. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? Like, you know, you might have a friend. I mean, in every friendship, there's going to be love tests. You might have a friend that doesn't treat you right. Maybe they're going through a time when they're walking and, you know, forget who they are. And uh, they mistreat you or misunderstand you or something. And um, if you, you know, just lash out at them and say, well, you know, I'm not going to be your friend anymore because, you know, I've got these stipulations. That's not love. You just failed a love test. And if you fail a love test... It's saying you're not very mature in the Lord. And so I, I know that's hard to hear, but I, I preach this to myself all the time. 
Okay, John 13, 34 to 35. A new commandment I give to you, this is Jesus speaking, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Now he said, this is the commandment. This is a commandment. This is not a new option I give to you. This is a new commandment. I'm commanding that you love one another as I have loved you. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. That's what marks us as a true follower of Jesus Christ is our love. Our love for him and our love for others, love for ourselves. He wants us to love. John 15, 12, he says again, this is my commandment says it again, that you love one another just as I have loved you. This I command you, that you love one another. No option. It's a command. So it needs to be the greatest command because that's what's going to cause holiness to manifest. No other way. It's through the, the manifestation of the love that is in our heart. In Romans 13.10, Paul, the apostle of grace, who knew a lot about love, he says, love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Now, if anyone knew the law, Paul, Paul did. In fact, he obeyed the law, you know, more than anyone else in his day. He, he, he loved the commandments of God and he obeyed them, but he said, I count it all as done. But he knew the law, but he said, love is the fulfillment of the law. If you walk in love, you're going to fulfill the law. In Ephesians 4, 2 and 15, Paul says this, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. So there's things that you need to address, but again, love needs to be the motive. So if you're seeing someone going out you know, hurting people through their behaviors or uh, misrepresenting Christ. Let's say they're in a place of leadership and they're misrepresenting Christ. Well, the truth needs to be spoken into that and it needs to be exposed. That's what love will do, not only for the person who is deceived by their actions and their words, but those that they are deceiving as well, those that they are hurting as well. So love will speak the truth, but we have to question, is this my own irritation? Am I just ticked off? Am I just, you know, in some kind of a, a, you know, I want to raise up a religious standard or am I saturated in the love of God and the love of God is compelling me to fight this love war? And that's the big question. And only God knows the heart, you know, and sometimes we deceive ourselves saying, oh, yeah, yeah, I love, I love, I love. And yet we could even have a small little test and fail it. And that will show you, no, your love is small. Your love is small. And so, um, you know, we need to take this seriously because God wants to fill us with more and more love. Colossians 3, 12 to 14, Paul says this. So as those who have been chosen by God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. And then beyond all those things, he said, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And so it, it, it's really interesting. He didn't say uh, to put on, um, you know, anger or to put on uh, righteous indignation. He didn't say, he said, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one. This is the great apostle Paul. He's not a wimp. He's not a, a, a cream puff. No, he is a strong man of God. And he's saying, put on a heart of compassion, put on kindness, put on humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. Beyond all those things, put on love. <laughs> And so we, we are to do that even in the hard places when we need to address things, when we need to take the sword of truth and, and expose the lies and establish the truth. This has to be our motive. The motive behind it all has to be to set everybody free. It has to be that at the end of the day, as painful as this is, the truth is going to be raised up and people will love each other. So, you know, if someone's out there and they're, they're, um, you know, murdering someone or beating up on someone. God loves that murder. He loves the person that's beating up on the person. But 
If he's going to love them well, he's going to deliver them out of that. He's going to do everything he can to pull them out of that. He will expose what they're doing. He will remove anything that aids them from doing it. And he will protect the person who the, the guy's attempting to murder. He will put them in safety. He'll do it. That's what love will do. Love's not going to say, oh, Oh, bless you, brother, as you murder this person. Or, oh, bless you as you're beating that person up. Of course not. That's not how love works. Love is strong. And love has integrity. And love will rescue people from evil. And um, that's just the heart of God. But love has to be the motive and not personal irritation. Or I'm going to throw the law at you or whatever. It has to be for the good of the other. Let the love of God be perfected in you. 1 Thessalonians 3.12, and may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people. 1 Timothy 1.5, these are all written by the apostle of grace, but the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. So any instruction that we give has to be from a pure heart of love. That's the goal of of our instruction is love. Okay, 2 Timothy 2.22, now flee from youthful lust and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. So we're to, to flee from youthful lust, and we'll preach this because it's the most loving thing to do is to warn people about the consequence of sin and how it will hurt them and damage them. We wanna make sure people know the truth about that so they don't go in that direction. But our goal is so that they will partake of the love of God and the purity of God. And we are going to pursue righteousness. We're going to pursue faith. We're going to pursue love and peace from a, from a, um, from a clean conscience and a pure heart. Hebrews 10, 24 says, and let us stimulate how to, or let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. So again, we should be, I hope I'm stimulating you right now to do uh, loving and kind actions because that will manifest God's holy uh, nature. First John 3, 11 and 14, it says, for this is the message which you have heard from the beginning that we should love one another. That is the message from the very beginning, love one another. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Whoa. And again, let's just examine our love tests that we have and see if we're passing them because that will be your thermometer of your spiritual maturity. Um, and, you know, if you're not passing them, you, you, will, you will get more tests. So you'll get another opportunity to grow in love and to nurture that love in your heart. 1 John 4, 7 to 8 and 11 to 12 and 16 and 20. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us, God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. This is the apostle of love saying this. He is a liar, for the one who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. So let's ask God to mature us in his love, to fill us with more and more love. It says in uh, 1 John uh, 4, I believe it is, it says, we love because he first loved us. And so when you receive the love of God for yourself, then it's so easy to go love others as he's loved you. And I just praise God for the revelation of his love and that love on the cross that he, that is the greatest revelation. If you don't have the revelation of the cross, and how God's love was, dem that was his ultimate passion, was on that cross, demonstrating love for all mankind, and especially for you personally. Um, if we don't have that revelation, 
it's going to be very hard for us to understand any love at all. We'll just be trying to do outward behaviors or align ourselves to the word with human effort, but we won't be able to really live until we understand that revelation of love. So I want to encourage you, number one, receive a fresh revelation of love. How do you do that? Ask for it and meditate on the scriptures of how much God loves you. And then ask him to help you pass every love test. Think of all the people in your life. How can you love them? How can you do good to them? Even your enemies, it says that we are to pray for them and we're to bless them and we're to bless those who persecute us. We're to love them. You know, what does that look like? And so let's love well, let's love perfectly. So in the first great awakening, that was a theme. And Wesley taught that theme. He taught that, that when you get a hold of the love of God and live out that love, experience that love, give that love to others, you will actually be manifesting holiness. And John Wesley, this is just a little bit of uh, trivia for you. He was the leader of a club in Oxford, uh, Oxford University called the Holy Club. And um, it was formed uh, for the purpose of getting together and studying the Bible and praying and um, just pursuing a very extreme Christian life because of their passion for the Lord. So his brother Charles Wesley actually founded it. And then George Whitfield uh, was also in that group as well as many others. Um, but they were committed to holiness. And those in that Holy Club, they raised the bar of faith of holiness, of love, and they influenced, um, definitely influenced the church because that was the first great awakening, really influenced the church more than anything because they brought it out of, um, challenged the, the um, religious structures that had come from the Catholic Church into the Church of England. They challenged all that and, and, and called for people to have a true form of worship um, unto the Lord from from the heart. So definitely the effect of the religious realm of society, but also the political realm, the education realms, the economic spheres, because um, mo most of them were actually uh, pretty affluent and uh, they were educated, they were well educated in law and all kinds of uh, things concerning uh, what was needed to build a healthy society. So in the first great awakening, especially when it came over to, to the USA, the first great awakening was actually responsible for the moral conscience of our nation. That's what founded it was in that, that first great awakening. So it was a call to holiness, but love, love was the greatest aim. We can't be holy without love because God is love. And if we're going to be separated unto God, we have to be separated unto love. So let's learn to love well. God bless you.